There's nothing quite like the motion and sounds of riding aboard a passenger train. The soothing rhythm of the click clack is sure to bring comfort. But wait, where did those click clacks go? I dubbed those in in post because though it may be what you see and hear in media, that faithful click clack sound we've always had, most trains these days in the US don't make that sound anymore. What's up guys, this is Heiss, and today we're gonna look into that. The short answer is that the clickety clack sound happens at the joint between rails. So we have two different rails right here. They're connected by what we call a joint bar. When the wheel rolls over that joint, it makes a clickety clack sound, at least a pair of them will. And most railroads these days in the United States have moved away from using jointed rail everywhere, though they still have to use them in some locations, and that makes for a bit of an interesting discussion. As well as, so does the history of jointed rail and how we got away from it in the first place overall. So I hope you'll stick around and learn something. One of the early reasons that railroads had joints in the rail was a rather simple one. Manufacturing, transporting, and shipping that rail. In the early days, it was really challenging to manufacture a super long stick of rail. It was something that hadn't been done yet before and didn't really make sense because there was no way to transport it around. And so you found that the early standard rail length was something that could be shipped on a train to where it needed to be installed. Most typically, in a gondola. That meant that your standard length of rail on a standard gauge railroad was 39 feet because it fit in a 40 foot gondola. And on the narrow gauge, we had 30 foot rail because that's what fit in the equipment that we had at the time. That meant that every rail length, you'd end up having a joint because that was as long of a piece of rail as they could make. So the typical joint bar is a rather simple device. It's basically an angled piece of steel, which might have a slightly different shape and contour for strength or for the type and weight of rail that it is going to support. And it has a number of holes in it to allow the joints to be made. They typically come in a four hole version <laughs> or a six hole version. So typically even then you'd still only use four of the six holes, which gets into some fun track maintenance things that I need to interview our track foreman for. It's amazing how big some of these components are when you take them off of the railway application and hold them in your hand. And a joint is just a pair of these guys attached to the web of the rail, though this is obviously for a larger weight of rail than this. Drilled through, bolted together, there you go. But not all joints were made equally. There were many other different types, not all of which I can represent, though I do have a fun one I want to share with you because we're again here at the Colorado Railroad Museum. We're very fortunate here at the museum to have several of these. This is a type of joint bar combo tie plate that the Denver South Park and Pacific Railroad used to use, Colorado's own South Park line. It is kind of a neat and goofy design where you have two locations that you can apply spikes on either side of the rail into the tie, and then you've got a primitive set of tapered clips that are connected with a U-bolt. And so you simply slide this over the rail spike it to the tie, and then you have the joint held together with one fastener all the way across. It's one piece rather than two, and theoretically any sort of twisting motion will get taken care of by the fact that both of the fasteners are held together by one singular bolt that's bent around. Now obviously this design didn't take off in other locations, so uh, it seems that the simpler approach wins. But if you have any other favorite kind of joint bar designs and things, let me know down in the comments below. There's so much neat stuff to railroad history depending on what part of the world and what sort of railway you're dealing with. And it's always fun to learn about, so let me know. So joints in the track are almost always staggered. They're never going to end up at the same spot down the railroad and both rails at the same time. And the reason for that is partly because anytime you have a curve, the outside rail is going to travel more distance than the inside rail is going to, so the joints are naturally going to end up spaced apart. But the real reason that they're staggered is a very important one, and it's based on the strength of the railroad itself. If you have your weakest point, the joint between two things, happen at the same spot on both rails, you're going to have more defects and more concerns and potentially more problems if you do that. And so the joints are intentionally staggered as well, unless they have to be at the same location for some reason which we'll get into. 
So the pros of jointed rail seem to make a lot of sense. It comes from us in history and it was really easy to make happen. It was simple to manufacture, simple to transport, simple to install, and really simple to repair. If you had a failure, you could cut out just a little portion, add another joint, call it a day. As well, it also helped with any sort of heat issues. Rail is a type of steel and steel likes to expand and contract significantly with temperature gradient. So if you're running a railroad, potentially out in the desert where the temperature can swing wide wildly between really hot and really cold, that could cause a lot of problems for your railroads. And that has historically caused a lot of problems for railroads. So having joints allows for some amount of that expansion and contraction, which helps to prevent the railroad from buckling out from underneath you, though it still does happen sometimes. But that's pretty much where the pros of jointed rail ends, other than the necessary things we still use it for today. Now, if we start to get into some of the cons of jointed rail, I think you'll understand why we went to continuously welded rail instead. A joint in the rail is a break in an otherwise smooth ride. And that's gonna cause wear on the rail, it's gonna cause wear on the wheels, it's gonna cause a non-smooth ride. That da dunk da dunk we get is the sound of the wheels and the rails both getting hit. It's not smooth and it causes problems. Plus in curves, the joints can tend to cause kinks rather than a smooth curve. So if you get into some really sharp curvature situations, you might find that the gauge, the distance between the rails starts to wander and that can cause locomotives to slip or the cars to even derail. What's more is that a joint, much like any other joint of any two systems in any fact of engineering, is a place where something can fail. And so as the locomotives pound in with the hammer blow that you've seen on a steam locomotive at these joints, things start to loosen over time, things start to work. The bolts working in those holes can cause cracking to start to happen, and then you can start to fracture the rail. There's all manner of different kinds of problems that can arise at a joint. And that's just talking about failure modes. It's not talking about some of the additional considerations. Joints were great when we didn't have an electronic signal system. Signals need an electronic current to pass all the way down through the rail to detect the presence of a train, and a joint is a gap in the rail. You can't guarantee that the electricity is going to flow through. Any track circuit on jointed rail is going to end up having little wired jumpers that are an additional step to install and an additional thing to maintain. Thinking of maintenance, if you don't maintain the track in good surface, i.e. the ballast is the right height, there's enough ballast, it's tamped and squished in there so that all of the pieces of rock are jagged and stuck together, holding the track locked in place. If you don't have that, the joints are gonna be where things tend to move and not only cause kinks, but that's where you can also get heat kinks like this. And that is one of the worst things you could come across on a railroad. So you can start to see why we developed continuous welded rail. The first case of continuously welded rail was back in 1933 here in the United States. And it meant that we could have a longer, smoother ride on our track without all the joints in it. Enter continuously welded rail, rail that has been welded together to form one long continuous rail. It's smoother, it's a better ride, it's better for high speed when you're talking about something that's gonna roll down the railroad because the higher the speed, the higher the tolerances have to be. You have to get the railroad really precise in order to run something like a big steam engine like this at 100 miles an hour. So the tolerances have to be tight and joints don't really allow for that tight of a tolerance. What's more is with that high speed comes shallower curves. And a shallow curve is kind of hard to make with short rail segments. But now with longer welded together rail segments, you can gently pull that curve any way you need to and allow for a higher speed railroad. Perhaps the biggest pro about continuously welded rail is the maintainability. What's the easiest way to maintain a joint in the rail? Not have one. So by eliminating the joints, you eliminate all the problems of broken bolts, missing bolts, cracking in the rail from the bolt holes themselves. All those problems were a thing of the past when you can just weld the joint and it becomes seamless. You might think with these super long sections of rail that expansion would become a much larger problem. And thankfully it hasn't because of other technology upgrades. By proper use of ballast, rail clips, rail anchors, and all of these other things within the railroad track itself, take a look at track 101 if you wanna learn a little bit more about the details on those pieces. With all those items, when everything is kept in good surface and is dressed nicely, we can hold a piece of railroad 
pretty tightly down. The compressive strength of all that compacted rock, the ties, the clips, the everything is absurdly strong, though you do still end up having expansion in some extreme situations, and there are special expansion joints in continuously welded rail for those certain applications, though they're relatively uncommon. The biggest success that we've had in railroad track laying, though, is learning when to actually lay the rail. If we lay the rail when the ambient temperature is the mean temperature that the rail is going to see, it's never going to get that crazy fluctuation, even in some of the extreme weather of the world, that's going to cause it to want to expand as much. You figure out the average, what it's going to be, and lay the rail at that temperature if you can. And that's going to lead to the most success, because you're minimizing the amount of thermal stress. All of these super long segments of rail that are then welded together to form super ultra long sections of continuous rail are even better for signals because you've got a continuous solid thing for that electrical current to flow through. It seems that the pros are everywhere with continuously welded rail. So why do we still have joints in most railroads? Well, the answer is in many cases we need them, or the line's level of service means that it didn't really merit getting continuously welded rail because of the amount of trains or the speed or the tonnage and costs. Perhaps the most common reason for joints still on the railroad today are switches and signals. You get to a switch, you're gonna have to have some joints, that's the nature of things. But when you're out there on the main, you don't necessarily need to have them, unless you have signaled applications that mean you need to have them. Signals, whether they're a semaphore, a color light, or a simple grade crossing itself, all need to have discrete blocks that the track is divided into in order to actually operate based on the logic that they're programmed with. They need to know if a train is on that section of track, and we do that by putting insulated joints in the track a special type of joint that makes sure the electrical current doesn't flow through. In this case, you do pair those joints up, and that way you have a discrete moment that, bam, that track circuit knows, hey, the train has arrived, I need to set the signal to red, or I need to make the gate start to come down. If you want to learn more about those applications, check out the videos that I've done, Signals 101 or Grade Crossings 101. There's a wealth of fun, nerdy information in there. Now, I know that my European commenters will be going, wait a second, and a lot of this doesn't apply to electrified railroads. Electrified railroads are a whole other animal. We're talking about what we primarily see in most of the United States here. Another location that still has a joint in modern day railroading is a joint between weights of rail. What I mean by that is that rail can come in different sizes. We have quite the strange allotment of sizes here being a museum and operating a narrow gauge. Up here we have some 30 pound per yard rail and down there we have some 70 pound per yard rail. So every three feet we have 30 pounds, 70 pounds, that's how you rate it. And this rail is so much shorter, less wide everything than that rail and that's still basically half of what most main lines tend to use today. So anytime you're having a joint between any of these different weights of rail, you have to have a compensated joint in order to make the transition and keep the profile smooth for the wheels. And this gets into some really deep nerdy stuff. Compensated joints are really interesting because they have to match the profiles of two different types of rail. And that incurs a lot of nuanced problems. You can see right here that we have a joint between 75 pound rail and 60 pound rail here at the museum. You can note the height difference, the width difference, everything. There's a lot of things that this joint has to compensate for, hence the name. The annoying thing about these is that they have to be made out of two different separate castings. Rather than having one type of joint bar, you have two that have to match. And that's because the height and the width changes on these rails. And we need the interior edge where the wheel and the flange are going to ride match all the way through smoothly. So the interior part of the composite joint is nice and straight, and the exterior part has to bow out further to accept the different type of rail. That means that a comp joint you have to stock two partnered pieces rather than just two random whatever joint bar off of the giant pile of joint bars you have. Other joints do exist in the rail, though they're different than what we talked about at diamonds and at switches, and that's where a wheel needs to pass through where an otherwise solid rail would have been. As well, it's also really common that branch lines or lesser used railroads tend to still just have jointed rail, because it's simpler than bringing in the gigantic crazy class one giant 420 foot long rail segment laying machine, and 
instead having rail welders and all these different things on staff to make sure that it can happen. It's just simpler to use the jointed rail. While researching this video, I've spent a lot of time looking at the subdivision on BNSF just across the street from us at the museum, the beer run that runs to the Coors Brewery, and found that it has a fascinating mix of jointed rail and continuously welded rail. Where they've done work recently, they've upgraded it to welded rail, but you can still see that past that, where they didn't need to do work, where the trains aren't moving so fast, it's all jointed rail all the way down. And then when we get into all the switches and crossings, you can see where the dedicated joints had to be to form the track circuits for the crossings and to allow the switches to be placed in as well. It's really interesting to see that mix. So in summary, though most of the Class 1 mainline is now continuously welded rail, you do still have the joints and that faithful click-clack that we love, where you have signals, switches, other special track, composite joints, or if it's a slightly lesser used piece of railroad that might be a little bit lower speed. Anyways guys, I hope you enjoyed this one, I hope you learned something, and as always, thank you so much for watching.